to help me. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Oh. 
one of the consequences of setting a scheme which is rather uh, mechanical of dividing the Gospel of Mark uh, into sections over three years is that you never know uh, what season of the year the individual sections will appear. And um, we're now in the third year of meditation upon the Gospel of Mark, and we have come now to chapter 13, which is probably one of the most ferocious of all the chapters in the Bible. It is one that is said to be the most difficult chapter in the Gospel. It is one of fire and thunder and uh, destruction and uh, the great apocalyptic vision of uh, the abomination of desolation, at which I will restrain the temptation to say, Merry Christmas. <laughs> it's the way it is. It's just the way it is. And this will continue on. We'll bracket this holy and joyful season of Advent and Christmas with uh, a rather ferocious portion of the sacred scriptures. But I think it's something for us to meditate upon and reflect upon as we enter into this portion of um, the Gospel of Mark. The first little section will be from the end of chapter 12 uh, and the famous account of the widow's might, of the, the way in which this poor widow was able to give so very little, and yet she gave her all. And that's, of course, a model for us all of our unstinting devotion, which we are called to give, no matter what it might be in quantity. But then we hear, we come into the longest single discourse in the Gospel of Mark, this whole chapter 13, which is a type of writing called apocalyptic. It is a writing of a vision of the end times. It is found most fully in the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse, but also found in the book of Daniel, found in some parts of the prophets, and it's found just before the Passion in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I think that is the signal for us, this sense of the end of the world, the cosmic dimension of what is about to happen in the suffering, death, and resurrection of our Lord. That is where it is situated in both, at all, Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I think that's also where it is situated in our lives. We sometimes have a rather banal sense of our life in Christ. We go from day to day, and even from liturgy to liturgy, from season to season, one after the other, going routinely. And yet we are engaged in a cosmic battle against evil, thrones and dominations and all the great forces of evil. And I think sometimes we, we forget that as we get into the rut of a Christian life lived routinely. And so it is perhaps appropriate at any time of the year to meditate upon this ferocious section of the gospel, and to do so as well for Luke and Matthew, to meditate upon that, and I think especially in our own days, when perhaps this section of the gospels does not seem as strange as it does in other happier times. As we see, we look on the television, we look around this world, and we do not need much imagination to see the apocalyptic vision of evil that impinges upon us. Sometimes uh, maybe we all look back to our youth and think, well, things were rosier then. And I think when I was growing up, people were afraid that atomic missiles would be coming across the North Pole, so maybe it's not good to look back too in too cheery a way. But I think these days especially, the reality of evil becomes more apparent to us. And we need to meditate upon these passages and see the stakes of the battle in which we are engaged. Just as we can learn in a merely secular way, but in a way deeply rooted in our faith, from J.R.R. Tolkien, who fought in the Battle of the Somme about 100 years ago, when he saw pure, raw evil. And out of that reality, that awareness, that lack of naivete, he created a vision, a profoundly Catholic vision, of the battle between good and evil, and the confidence that those who serve selflessly can conquer the power of evil not by their own strength, but by the power of God that is beyond them. 
So with that in mind, we now enter into Lectio Divina in this portion of the Gospel of Mark. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us let go of all those barriers, our own ego, our sins, those barriers to the passage of God into our own lives. Let there be a pathway to our hearts so that he may enter in as we hear his word. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the multitude putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums and a poor widow came and put in two copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury, for they all contributed out of their abundance. But she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, her whole living. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what wonderful stones, what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when will this be? And what will be the sign when these things are all to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, take heed that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed, this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. But take heed to yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils. And you will be beaten in synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you up, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver up brother to death, and father his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the desolating sacrilege set up where it ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down nor enter his house to take anything away. And let him who is in the field not turn back to take his mantle. And alas, for those who are with child or for those who give suck in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days, there will be such tribulation as not been from the beginning of creation, which God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not shortened the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. False Christs and false prophets will arise and show signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But take heed, 
I have told you all things beforehand. Let's reflect upon this passage. And as always, when we read the sacred scriptures, what does it say to my head that I may know the Lord and his plan, to my heart that I may be drawn closer to him, to my hands that it may show me how I should behave and act in this present hour. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the multitude putting money into the treasury. And many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, her whole living. And he sat there opposite the treasury and watched the multitude putting money into the treasury. And many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two copper coins, which make a penny. So often the Lord speaks to us of the generosity which we must show in our life. And here we see people the treasury of the temple of the Lord, giving various amounts of money, some very generously, and it would not be there without that generosity. Many rich people putting in large sums. And a poor widow came, and she was truly vulnerable. For in those days, particularly, a widow was absolutely exposed to the dangers of society. She had very little to protect her. And that is a person absolutely dependent upon the goodwill of others, absolutely dependent upon the providence of God. She did not have these great sums to pour into the treasury. And she put in two copper coins, two little, tiny, tiny coins. She had two of them. So she could have been as wise as St. Martin of Tours, a very holy saint, who took his cloak and cut it in half and gave one half to cover the beggar at the side of the road, but kept the other practically for himself. She had two little coins. So maybe she might have put one of the little coins in the treasury and kept the other little one. It wasn't much, but it was something. But instead, even though she had two little coins, she put both of them in, although they're only worth a penny. That's total dedication. Each one of us, you know, we're, we're given, each one of us in different ways, different gifts, talents, we say, using another parable, another place in the Gospels. Maybe great bars of gold, like those talents were in the other parable, or maybe little coins. We don't judge. And sometimes we cannot ourselves see the gifts we have, what we have from the Lord. And yet we are called to love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our mind and all our soul, to give everything to the Lord, not to be emptying out our bank accounts necessarily. That's not what we're thinking of here. But here we see someone who gives everything when she could have given less. And so let's reflect upon that and the deeper meaning in our own life. We may have a lot, we may have a little, and if we have a lot, we're gonna see in a short time, a lot can be taken away. This beautiful temple can all come crashing down. But what matters is that disposition of the heart here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. To give all our heart and mind and soul, to be totally 
a feather on the breath of God. Why is it that she had that generosity in her heart to do so? Because it isn't simply a matter, I don't think, of physical wealth. People who are very, very wealthy can have the same disposition of the widow. And people who are financially poor can be very clinging as well. It's not a financial calculation. Somebody once said that in a monastic environment where people don't own anything, and I think it was a monk who said this, people can cling to a little cup that's mine. Mine, my precious. We can cling to anything. And even when it comes not to poverty, but to obedience and to ambition, they say that, you know, people in a very ordered society of holy religious can kill one another to become subassistant door ringer. My position. So it's, it's not so much a question of the size of the bank account. It's a question of the disposition to give both the coins, the whole, everything. What does that say to me? And he called his disciples to him and said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, her whole living. They gave a little bit because it was out of their abundance. They gave the leftovers to God. And she gave out her very life. And we might think of that and the way we relate to others. How often do we simply give out of our abundance to the people around us? In material possessions, perhaps, in time as well, or in other things. And do we give truly a sacrificial gift? Lately, I've been asking that a lot of people to make a sacrificial gift. <laughs> and uh, it, the amount does not really matter. It really doesn't. It's to make a sacrificial gift. Where it really speaks not just to an extra, but to deep within. It's the same, I think, with our gift of time to the Lord and a gift of time to other people. Time being more precious than money. Let's not give to others out of our abundance a little extra time we have for God or neighbor, but let's give something deep, a sacrificial gift, like the widow who is not just sort of giving leftovers. We must not give God leftovers. We must not give other people just the other stuff we don't really need anyway. We need to go deep. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the multitude putting money into the treasury. And many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, her whole living. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones, what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And there isn't. This is the great temple of Jerusalem, which was spectacular. We have descriptions in the historian Josephus. It was so stunningly beautiful, so enormous, it seemed forever it would be there. And yet, in August and September of the year 70, 
the Roman armies came and they just destroyed it all. In a terrible massacre of people, with a siege and with famine and with horrible sufferings described in brutal detail by the historians of the day, that's the background to this chapter, that foreshadowing of the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. And the people came to depend too much upon the security of their faith and their religion. And so too can we. It's a good thing to keep in mind when you're repairing buildings that that's important to do, but of course they don't fall down. But it's not what it's all about. Somebody once pointed out that the magnificent St. Peter's Basilica began to be formed just about the time of the Reformation. And that the final beautiful decoration was put on the League of Nations building designed to stop war just before World War II. So we got to yeah, use these things. They are to the glory of God, beauty, goodness, truth. But we can't let anything less than the simple spirit of the profoundly dedicated widow guide our lives. And we must not be distracted. How often am I distracted by physical things or by things which are not of lasting permanence? Whatever they might be, and for each of us they're different. So that I do not really think of what really matters. Let's reflect upon that. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign when these things are all to be accomplished? We all like to know that. And later on, not the passage the next time, we hear that it's, not, it's a vain effort to try to get exact details for these great events in history. We want to get a control on them. Peter, James, John, they want to be able to predict and therefore to control. And we do not know the day or the hour is the basic thing when it comes to trying to know the future as a way of predicting and controlling. So that's a vain question. Tell us, when will this be and what will be the sign when these things are all to be accomplished? We do need to be attentive to the fragility of this world and to the powers of evil against which we are engaged in battle. And we need to know not to put our trust in things that are not profound, not put trust in superficial things, but it's not for us to be trying to get a grip on all of that by a vain exercise of control trying to get our hands in the steering wheel of history. And that is really what apocalypse has always remind us of. It's ironic that apocalypses are often used to start as prediction machines, as Ouija boards, to try to help people get a control of the chaos of life. And heaven knows there's enough of it around. But the opposite point is there in this and in the book of Revelation and so many others. The point is to surrender to the providence of God. Then you don't fear the chaos. The great symbol of chaos in the Old Testament is the sea, which is tumultuous and cannot be bounded except by God. And at the end of the apocalypse, it says, and there will be no more sea, which is a good thing to quote in the movie, the Titanic. You can't control these things. It's, it's amazing that point, that that's what they did. <laughs> that's just the point. So let's just think of the times we want a sign from our faith or whatever, from the way we live our religious life. 
so that I can get a grip and control what's going to happen to me. In other words, I can make God into a drone or God into something, a computer, or God into a slave, I guess, so that I can use the divine power to be sure I'm secure in a way that puts me in control, rather than surrendering in the midst of the chaos to the provident hand of God. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign when these things are all about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, take heed that no one leads you astray. For they were afraid and vulnerable and fearful. They were right to be led astray by people giving them the security they yearned for and therefore controlling them. Take heed that no one leads you astray because if you're looking for some kind of a sign, someone will come and say, I've got it. And once you think you've got the sign from them, they control you. Take heed that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And that's the most difficult. People speaking in the name of the Lord, even the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, down through history have indeed done that. To use the divine power, use the divine name to lead people astray. And that is uh, a dangerous temptation. It is the problem of a false prophet to say, thus says the Lord, when really, it is just thus says my own ego. We can all be vulnerable to the, on the receiving end of that, yearning for what they used to speak of with Napoleon, you know, the man on the white horse. And we can all yearn for that. So much tragedy. And if we have put our trust in the providence of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, we will be immunized against such treachery and such deceit. I think G.K. Chesterton once said, when people have given up belief in God, they'll believe anything. <laughs> and I think it's in a highly secular society of the type we have now, that people are most likely to be real victims and very vulnerable to whoever comes along with a false God. Much better to adore the real God than to be vulnerable to the many false gods that are generated out of our own egos and the desire for control. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place. For the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. This is, what will the world be like on the day of the end of the world? Well, there'll be wars and rumors of wars. In other words, a typical day. You know, a typical day. There'll be famines, there'll be, this is, the veil of tears through which we journey. This is the world of the four horsemen of the apocalypse in which we are called to live. There are orcs everywhere. Fear not, furry-footed little hobbits. You need not fear them if your heart is pure. You don't rely on anything other than that purity of heart. But take heed to yourselves. In this world, in which we are called to serve the Lord until he comes in glory. And maybe that is why this is appropriate in Advent time to have this passage, because it is really about the coming of the Lord at the end of time and in this world as he comes. Take heed to yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils and you'll be beaten in synagogues and you'll stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness and testimony before them and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. 
And when they bring you to trial and deliver you up, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver up brother to death, and father his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. This is the environment in which we are called to serve Jesus. Just earlier this afternoon, I, I was looking, uh, scanning uh, one of these little digests of blogs, and I don't know, I followed a link to a photograph, which is appropriate because of the recent journey of the Holy Father to Uganda. I'd heard for years of the famous Charles Lawanga and the martyrs of Uganda about half of them Anglican, half of them Catholic. The ecumenism of blood of which Pope Francis speaks. But I never thought I'd ever see what Charles Lawanga looked like. And here was this photograph from just about a year before he was martyred. There you have a bunch of young men there greeting the new bishop. And they point out this one here is Karoli Lawanga. This is Charles Lawanga, the great leader of the martyrs who protected the young men against the wicked king. And all of them gave their life for Christ. And that happened in the 19th century near the end. This is the world that we need no imagination to be aware of. This world that our Lord describes is where he wants us to serve him is the world of the Coptic martyrs of Libya, the world of so many people in our own area whose relatives are being killed. There has never been a time when Christians are more persecuted than now, although you would be hard pressed to see that acknowledged. Everything's sort of glossed over in our society. And yet these martyrs, it's astonishing. And so we should be attentive to this passage and apply it to our own time. Cardinal George famously said that he felt he would die in bed, his successor in prison, the successor's successor be martyred, and the next one would be there for the rising up of the church again. Who knows whether that prediction will take place. But we need to be, to smarten up, wake up, be alert, and recognize that we are not simply given the luxury of living Christianity in a rut. But we are called, engaged in a serious battle. This is why it's very good to, to read two poems by Chesterton. One of them, Lepanto, and the second one, the Ballad of the White Horse, which speak of the great struggle against seemingly invincible forces, which are not. So let's meditate upon that and think of in our own daily life, how are we seeking to live faithfully? Whatever the challenge is so much smaller than what Charles Lawanga and the current martyrs are facing, but take heed of yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake, to bear testimony before them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you up, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say what is ever, whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Let's ask the Lord to give us that spirit of surrender to the will of God. Not trying again to get our hand on things, but saying, here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. Do not be fearful, be not afraid. As our Lord himself says, be not afraid. For the Holy Spirit will teach you will give you the words you need. What you need to do is to surrender to the will of God. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Not listen, Lord, your servant is speaking.
that spirit must be ours. And brother will deliver our brother to death and father his child and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. We often think of beautiful virtues, faith, hope, and love being the greatest of them all. We think of kindness and joy and so many beautiful things, including mercy, which our Holy Father is really asking us to meditate upon in this coming year. But the virtue that Christ is offering to us when he reminds us of the magnitude of the struggle is none of those. It is the tough, persistent virtue of endurance he who endures to the end. Like the widow, it is not spectacular. It is not a beautiful tree rising up to the heavens, but a tough little shrub, which generally survives more than the big things. Maybe we need a bit of that in our life. One of the unromantic virtues, endurance. And so often, if you look at the stories of the saints, that is what is important. And to have endurance, it cannot be based upon proud competence or anything, or what our Holy Father so often refers to as Pelagianism, the sense that I can do it myself. But what makes us capable of enduring anything is the vision of the glory of God and a profound humility in his presence and a trust in his providence. And to have that, we need to be purified of our egos through the sacrament of reconciliation and spend time in adoration before our Lord and the blessed sacrament saying, here I am, Lord, my Lord and my God. And to enter into the life of the sacraments, especially the Holy Eucharist, we, we don't have the luxury of a superficial faith. We can't be living at the level of the branches and twigs. We never could, but we sure can't now, including in our secular society where we're not having our heads cut off. We have to live at the level of the roots, not the branches and the twigs. And in that, we will find the endurance that allows us to be what God calls us to be. In many of our brothers and sisters, are experiencing it in its ferocity right now, the new martyrs. It should concentrate our minds. And then he speaks of the coming destruction of the temple. Caligula, about seven years after the suffering, death, and resurrection of the Lord, ordered that his own statue be set in the temple. Fortunately, he died before that happened because his general said, there will be riots if you try that. But this was what was coming. And when you see the desolating sacrilege set up there it, where it ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the house stop not go down or enter his house to take anything away. Let him who is in the field not turn back to take his mantle. But alas, for those who are with child and for those who give suck in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation, which God created until now, and never will be. And if the Lord had not shortened the days, no human being could be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. False Christs and false prophets will arise and show signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But take heed, I have told you all things beforehand. And so we come into that reality of the destruction of, most immediately, of the 
the end of the world which Jesus, in which he lived and preached, the end of the world of what we call Second Temple Judaism, the destruction of the temple. And this is very close to what happened. And when these things come upon us, well, it's like they say, if you're evacuating an airplane, don't be, you know, rustling around to get your trinkets. You know, get moving. <laughs> Too many of these little things. Don't go chasing after your mantle in the field or don't wait. Just when there are important things happening, we're dealing with life, death, destruction. Forget all those little things that so occupy our hearts and our lives. This whole passage of chapter 13 is ferocious, but it is there because it speaks of the great battle in which we are engaged, in which we do not have and should not have the luxury of being caught up with inconsequential things, whether it be wealth or whether it be health or whether it be whatever. We've got to focus. As Ronald Knox said, a great writer in the 20th century, that he was, he had been trained at the greatest of all the schools. Beautiful, he was a brilliant student at Eton and Oxford and everything else. And then he ended up as a schoolmaster in a poor little Catholic school, which barely had any resources at all. Of course, they, except they had this magnificent teacher, Father Ronald Knox. But he said one thing he noticed was that whereas in these great and famous schools, which he himself had attended, there were wonderful libraries and all kinds of things and tremendous literary things. He found that although none of that was present in the little Catholic school, he was impressed by how the, the children in the school had been taught to fly to the heart of things. And that's what really matters. So in this apocalyptic passage, the Lord is saying to us, fly to the heart of things. And don't wait behind to pick up your mantle in the field or dither in the house. Fly to the heart of things. And that's why we need to concentrate on word and sacrament. Why we need to celebrate the Holy Eucharist with devotion. Why those who are called to pray the divine office need to recognize it is the office to pray for others. It's not our own ego that is at the heart of things, it's the Lord. And what draws us to Christ, to the center of things, is what we need to be attentive to and let the rest take care of themselves. And in the midst of it all, he says, take heed, I have told you all these things beforehand. This is ferocious. But the Lord is there in the behind it all, shortening the days because he knows we can't handle it in its full strength, but he's there. And he gives us here as well the wisdom to tell false Christs from the Lord himself. All these false saviors we can set up. He says, forget all of that. Go to what matters. That is a good preparation for the account of the suffering, death, and resurrection of the Lord, which is what's about to follow in the gospel. And that's a good preparation for Christmas. We think of the most important thing of all, not the armies of Rome, but the little babe at Bethlehem, although it didn't seem visibly to be important. And that's important when we look at the Blessed Sacrament. So insignificant superficially, so profound, much more so than all the other things that we see in this world. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the multitude putting money into the treasury. And many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury, for they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, her whole living. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. 
And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign when these things are all to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, take heed that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. But take heed to yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you up, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver up brother to death, and the father, his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the desolating sacrilege set up where it ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let him who is on the housetop not go down nor enter his house to take anything away. And let him who is in the field not turn back to take his mantle. And alas for those who are with child and for those who give suck in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be great such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation which God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not shortened the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. False Christs and false prophets will arise and show signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But take heed, I have told you all things beforehand. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.